Does the man you're dating or married to actually know you? Well, here's how you can tell. So I get asked all the time if I'll do some videos about green flags because I talk about so many red flags because there's so many. There's an endless list of red flags. Uh, and also what, what I'm about to tell you, just because it's a green flag doesn't mean it's like green, green means go flag. It's a like, okay, that's a good sign, but there's no list. Okay. There's literally no list. I can tell you what to look out for based on my own experiences and the experiences of my friends. I can tell you like, what's a huge red flag versus like a, mm, keep an eye on this red flag. Uh, I can tell you green flag, but at the end of the day, um, a, this all has nuance and B, no list will prepare you. No list will protect you. It, 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 it doesn't work that way. So before I give this example, the most important part about dating is educating yourself about what the signs of abuse, the signs of a selfish man, the signs of an entitled man, because at the end of the day, it's all rooted in entitlement. Patriarchy is all about entitlement. So if you sense this person feels entitled to you, your time, your body, and doesn't seem to reciprocate, doesn't seem to uh, understand that you owe him nothing and that you are an individual that exists on your own right and that your O, your happiness, your job, or you know, if, if you work, uh, and all those things are just as important as his. If that is not uh, like very clear, get out. Do not date this man, he will ruin your life. I would love to give you a list that will help you protect you and be a shield, but that doesn't exist. That's not realistic. And it would be dangerous for me to tell you, okay, if you just do all this, no one will, none of these men will hurt you. Because a lot of times, just like that, they switch as soon as you get pregnant, as soon as you get married, as soon as something big happens, uh, as soon as you move to their country. So never assume you are fully safe. Always have a bank account that he has no access to. Always have your own money. You always have a backup plan and escape route. I don't care how safe you feel in a relationship. So I saw this, um, this tweet today and it reminded me of how I saw this as a huge red flag and then how I saw it as a green flag with the right person. Like one guy absolutely failed the test and the other one passed with flying colors, okay? So it started with this, this tweet right here. My, and she, she, look, she wrote that um, on uh, December 21st, 2022. My date last night bought a New Yorker subscription in the middle of our date so he could read all my articles later. Is this my husband now? She posted this today. Reader, he was in fact my husband. We're getting married. And then this little follow-up note here. I'd also like to note that I turned 40 in six weeks. So if you feel like it's never going to happen for you, I need you to hang on to a tiny, tiny sliver of hope while you keep living your best life. So not only is that really great advice in general and the same kind of stuff I say on my page all the time. And that's also just a part of like living the decenter men life. Doesn't mean you're just like, yeah, some women are. They're like, I'm done or even less, but a lot of women just are tapping out and that's fine. I respect that decision. As a lot of y'all know, I didn't date. I mean, I had like random hookups every once in a while, like one night stand, like hate forks and crap like that. Um, but for, you know, my twenties and half of my thirties, I didn't mess with men. I didn't even date them. In general, I focused on living my best life. Now I know I've never wanted kids, so I had the benefit and privilege of not having to worry about that whole, you know, drying up and eggs dying and stuff. I, most, some, some of the happiest couples I know met in their 30s and had kids. But for me, when I did start, even after I got out of that abusive relationship, I, again, I, I, I was like celibate for 12 of my adult years, not back to back, but like 12 years. Nothing, no kissing, no, I didn't go on, nothing, nothing. That's a lot, y'all. But I was doing, I was doing my thing, living my best life. People ask me how, why I have had like nine lives. That right there is why. I didn't get in a relationship with men because I just in, in, intuitively knew they would derail my life. I just knew it. I knew, and I also knew I was like co codependent and I didn't even want to test that one out. So I was like, nope, not going there. And even when I did finally get in a relationship, if you even want to call it that, at 36, and it was an abusive one and I almost died, I was like, okay, I'm going back to living my best life and having a sliver of hope. Just enough so that I'm willing to go on dates sometimes, but going back to focusing on living my best life. 
That way, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. I'm already like accepted it and used to that. Danger is the most high stakes decision I can make is dating a man because I could get swept away into another terrible relationship. So I did not put a whole lot of effort into it. I started really paying close attention to red flags, giving less and less benefits of the doubt, and always had a little bit of hope, but not more than that because men exploit our hope. And if you have too much of it, it's like having a target on your head. So when I actually started dating again, I waited at least a year after that relationship, to even like be alone with a man other than maybe a friend because I was so terrified of men. I didn't really tell many people I was a writer. Or if I did, I, if I told them I was a writer, I, I didn't tell them my last name because I write about my life. You know, if I was just like, um, I don't know, like a culture writer and I have done that, or if I just wrote, a, a, just wrote about celebrities and culture and all that stuff, it'd be one thing. But I have so many stories about my personal life, um, domestic violence, like my schmag's life, lots about my schmag's life, like my life and then podcasts. There's so much about my life out there. I didn't want these men listening because my ex had listened to that stuff and then used that against me. So it made me really afraid to share my work with men. So unlike her, um, I would have never given somebody my last name so they could re read my stuff. But we all, it's, that's because you know, I'm a different kind of writer and journalists than other people. Again, I would have no problem doing that if it was, you know, not my personal life. And so for me to give my last name to a man, big deal, big, big deal. There's only maybe a few men that I gave it to in all that time because none of those relationships last long enough for me to give them my name, you know, and they respected why I didn't give it to them. And another reason for that is if they, if they, now men are not gonna Google us the way we Google them because, you know, we're afraid that we're gonna end up, you know, in a refrigerator with duct tape across our mouth and our head cut off. But I didn't want a man to have the opportunity to learn all about me and then I don't know about him. It's not fair. I wanted to get to know him in real time. I wanted to tell these stories to his face myself rather than him just hearing all this stuff. That to me just kind of robbed that intimacy and the balance of intimacy. Because, you know, when sharing your life is your job, um, a, it, it, like, again, it's not fair, but it's not fun. I don't want someone to listen to me tell a story on stage because that's a performance. I would rather share that story in real time because a conversation is much different than me telling a story on stage. That's not a conversation. Maybe, maybe I'll react to someone laughing or a comment, but in general, that's me going blah, 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 blah. Thank you, thank you, and then getting off the stage. It's not engagement. There's the, the audience can be like, excuse me, can you tell, I don't understand, why did he? The, that's, that's, that doesn't happen. And so I'm not, a, I'm saying this because I'm not ashamed of any of my stories out there. But after having dated a man who literally used my stories against me, against me, and I can go into that uh, once I have a paywall. Again, I'm very careful what I share in, in, on my public space now. But I did never want to be in that position again where someone could mine details of my life that they'd heard on a podcast or read in a story and then throw it in my face to manipulate me. However, Breadcrumb Guy is one of the, is the only person I dated other than um, my boyfriend of a year when I first moved to France and then my husband. Again, most men didn't even get to that level of learning my last name. Sometimes I would send some of my articles to men that I hooked up with that I'll never see again because I was like proud of my work and they wanted to hear about it. But I'm like, whatever, like I'm not going to date you. Now you can read it. <laughs> But breadcrumb guy. This is the guy I talked about in this piece that I wrote for Shondaland several years ago. Uh, Google that title if you want to read it. Breadcrumb guy. He knew it was a big deal for me to share my work with him. He knew that that was a monumental moment for me to be like, okay, I'll tell you, I, I'll tell you my name. And I also knew because I knew he wasn't that invested in me that he would not just like Google a bunch of stuff. I already, I had already accepted that long ago. This guy was very low effort. But I thought that. You know, he was like, yeah, I'd love to read your stuff. But I'm like, okay. Uh, and so finally I was like, okay, I'll send you an article. So I sent him this one. This was one of the, like the lowest stakes articles I could have possibly sent him. It was uh, for The Guardian. And it was about them, you know, shaming um, adults for living at home and all this stuff. And I was just trying to, anyway, it was just opinion piece. Like almost nothing about my personal life. I mean, a little bit, almost everything I write has a little bit about my personal life in it. 
but one of the like, lowest stakes article I could have ever sent this man. While knowing full well that if he was curious enough, he could have Googled my name and read, I don't know, this one that I literally wrote while I was dating him because we are not in a committed relationship because he couldn't commit. So I was still like forking other dudes because, you know, I'm not waiting for a man. But I really just desperately wanted this man to like commit to me. Until he was willing to, I was, you know, brown chicken, brown cow. Like knowing that he could, you know, read about this threesome. <laughs> I think I wrote that when I was with him. I don't remember. But he definitely could have written, I definitely wrote this one when I was uh, with him about how uh, I don't really want men staying over at my house when I fork them. Get out of my bed, I need to sleep. You no, know, like I'm talking about my, my Schmeg's life. There's, uh, I had a video, uh, an article go viral, semi-viral about being a cougar. I'm making fun of the word, by the way. And how younger men just loved me. As in my 40s, men and you know, like uh, you don't hit a wall. You don't hit a wall. And even though I wrote another article, a follow-up about how I'd been in uh, 17 tabloid and in the dictionary as a cougar because of that article, all of this while I was dating him. He could have easily found this out if he just Googled my name. But the dude, honestly, is too lazy to do that. Okay, not lazy. He's not lazy. Worked very hard at things he cared about. He just didn't care. Uh, you know, again, I was in the Daily Mail. Stupid British press. I, I hate them. I was in The Sun, The Mirror, all these ones, right? He could have found any of this out by me giving him my name. So for me, it was a risk. I felt so vulnerable because again, he could read all this stuff by me giving him my name and sending him that one article where he finally knows it's Melanie Hamlet, right? You know, I sent that article to him and I had a feeling he would not read it. But then I was like, well, how could you not? How could you be dating a writer who is successful and not read like, I mean, at the very least, is he not curious? <laughs> like, come on. So when I asked him about it, I was like, so what'd you think about that article? Did you read it? He's like, yeah. You know, oh God, y'all, I will never forget this. He was like, yeah, that part about how, you know, they, they, uh, you know, share money with other journalists or uh, like, I forget exactly what he said. I was so confused. I was like, what? where did I mention other journalists in that? Like, what is he talking about? And then it hit me. This, this is what comes up. <laughs> when you, when you click on an article for the guardian, this is what comes up before you can read it. And it's just like, Hey, uh, eh. You know, we're free. We do quality reporting. Can you maybe, you know, like give some money? Like that, that's what that is. You do, you know, and most people are like, no thanks. <laughs> uh, hence another reason why journalism is dying. Uh, but this is what he read. So he was quoting this about quality reporting and... Uh, <laughs> the dude never read it. He never even read it. He didn't care. And that's when I was like, oh my God. I cannot imagine I mean, because at this point, we had actually kind of started, we're moving towards maybe boyfriend, girlfriend, um, not quite. I, 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 and then I started seeing it everywhere. Like, I already knew. But one of the reasons why I ended up, like, finally, like, breaking it off, he came over to my house one night and brought pudding. And I was like, I rarely eat sweets. The only time I eat sweets, because I ha I'm narcoleptic, for those of you who don't know, I pass out if I eat too much sugar. Uh, it makes me feel really bad. I get bloated. So the only time I really eat dessert is like birthdays or maybe if we're going out to dinner, I'll split a dessert. But it usually makes me feel really bad. So I never, ha I've never keep um, desserts in my house uh, unless we have company coming over, right? And this man showed up in my house. He never showed up with anything. He always showed up empty handed. And he showed up in my house with like a four pack of pudding. A French man. Just for any of y'all who think that they're romantic, I don't know where y'all get that idea. Like, so, so so few of them are actually romantic. Like, anyway, that's a whole nother conversation. But I remember being like, what the hell am I gonna do with this? I was like, why did you bring this? Like, yeah, I thought you might want it. And I'm like, oh my God, this man doesn't know me. He literally doesn't know me and he doesn't care to know me and won't even read my article. He just clicked on it and read, <laughs> You can't unsee that. And those kind of men are the men who are going to be low effort, who are going to just take and take and take and take and, and give you anything that you give them access to. They're just going to take it, but they're not going to give anything in return. Those are the men who are going to be giving you um, the worst birthday presents ever, if they even remember it. Those are the kind of men that if you keep taking it farther and farther, who are going to be doing this when interviewed on television. 
what is your daughter's birthday? Uh, May 17th. Oh, no, it's the 14th. I don't know what year. Can you name your daughter's teacher? This is Jones. Nope. What's your birthdays? Ah, uh, why do you do this to me? What about Eric? I give up. Any guesses? <laughs> yesterday. Oh, yeah, yesterday. <laughs> Horrible. That's the kind of father men like that are going to be. But you know what kind of husband they're going to be? They're going to be the ones who leave your, your stocking empty on Christmas. They're going to be the ones when you say, what do you like about me? They're like, oh, you're such a, you're, you're so giving. You're so kind. You're a great mother. You, you know, you keep the house clean. You really take care of us. And everything is about what you do for him. None of it is about what you are in your own right. What kind of person you are. You are replaceable. A man who will not who doesn't care about your hobbies, doesn't care about what you care about. Yeah, I mean, women pretend to care about crap that men care about all the time. Women who can't stand sports will now become, you know, a football wife. I'm not saying that women don't like football, but some of them, and I know some of them, couldn't care less about sports. Now all of a sudden, every, you know, Sunday, they're at the stadium, shivering, right? Like, m women are just supposed to adapt to men and what they care about. And we will go, go along. I, I mean, climbers. Have you, I mean, uh, so many women that I meet climbing only got into it because their boyfriend needed someone to belay them. A belay birch. There's literally a term for it. Those are the kind of men who will expect you to cheer them on, to show up at their comedy shows, to read every piece of, of uh, literature that they write, who cheer them on at the end of their marathon, but would never do the same for you. Men want cheerleaders. They want m women to laugh at their dumb jokes. They want mom, therapist, unpaid schmegs worker, nanny, uh, managers and secretary, all these other things, but especially someone to build them up and cheer them on and be in their sidecar of life. And if a man is not super eager to read what you do, isn't, doesn't wanna know all about you right out of the gates, that man is not interested in you and he will never love you. He will just do what patriarchy lets him do and suck the life out of you, give nothing back.